Our next speaker is Dr. Jason Yap, a family physician. Dr. Yap is the anchor doctor at Parkway Shenton Medical Group Clinic in the arcade at Raffles Place and holds the appointment as clinical lead for Parkway Shenton Primary Care Network that oversees team-based care of patients with chronic medical conditions from 36 clinics within the organization. Today, he'll be sharing about his experience on cancer detection, the role of primary care physician. Dr. Yap, please. Good afternoon. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thanks for the invitation. As we all know, Healthier SG will be rolled out next year. And a very large part of Healthier SG is on preventive care. In fact, the whole healthcare transformation will be focused on preventive care. And in preventive care, cancer detection plays a very important part of what a primary care doctor should be doing in his primary care practice. I have asked uh, two of my colleagues in the executive health screeners to share with me some of the cancer detection that they had over the past couple of months. And indeed, I was very pleasantly surprised how many cancers they have picked up. For instance, this is an three-year-old uh, Indonesian gentleman who presented with uh, enlarged prostate where it was nodular and a PSA test was done and it confirmed cancer. And another one, the 39-year-old uh, married lady who presented with rectal bleeding for two months. And indeed, just by doing a simple per rectal examination, a heart friable mass was detected and later on found to have cancer from colonoscopy. And 45-year-old married woman who came for routine health screen and a mammogram was done and indeed breast cancer was just detected without any difficulty. Another one, 35-year-old lady who had a uh, left breast lump. And again, for this particular lady, uh, ultrasound was done because she's less than 40 and the taller than wider uh, images was uh, present and that picked up a cancer stage one of the breast. And 52-year-old gentleman, left thyroid nodule and ultrasound was done and that also picked up a cancer. Another one, uh, this is interesting, hyperacusis of the uh, right ear. And the uh, colleague of mine was very uh, sharp in the acumen and immediately ordered rhinoscopy and CT scan of the head showed early stage uh, MPC. And a 40-year-old uh, lady who presented with abdominal uh, bloatedness and uh, secondary amenorrhea and ultrasound picked up ovarian cancer. And uh, another one who had a persistent watery vagina discharge and uh, a team prep uh, picked up uh, cancer of the cervix. And finally, gastro clear. This is something that some uh, may want to consider doing because the patient may not uh, be keen to uh, do a gastroscopy. And uh, gastro clear, when it shows intermediate or high risk results, and the uh, scope then can be arranged. It is also helpful for us to know when we want to consider cancer screening, uh, where are the evidences? So, Screening Test Review Committee report in 2019 had come up with uh, outlines where appropriate screening tests based on scientific evidence and risk profile of the individual uh, can be used in order for us to consider the different types of screening. For instance, Category 1 is suitable for population level screening where there is robust evidence and uh, is clinically effective and uh, cost effective. For instance, pap smear to screen for cervical cancer and a fit test for colorectal cancer. And category two, where this is suitable for individual level decision, where it is not for the entire population, but it's only for the high risk population. Uh, what is category two? For instance, uh, just for an illustration, kidney function that is useful for screening for impairment of the kidney function in persons with diabetes, uh, not for screening of the entire population. Or, for instance, those who have hepatitis B and uh, ultrasound of the liver is uh, considered as a screening that is suitable for individual level decision. 
Category 3, uh, this is not recommended. There is insufficient evidence, it is not effective, uh, and there is net harm that uh, outweighs the benefits. And this is the, in the schematic form where we can easily see uh, which of the screen cancer belong to which category. Category 1, you have pap smear, mammogram, uh, or cord blood uh, for uh, stool tests, and these are all effective and cost-effective for general population. And category 2, this is useful for high-risk population. Example, those who have hepatitis B and ultrasound of the liver is uh, considered a good test for such high-risk individual. And category 3, there's insufficient evidence on, on its usefulness, and uh, pelvic ultrasound is one. And another one is a tumor marker like CA125, where net harm outweighs the benefits. Why? Because some of these individuals who have raised uh, CA125 may be because of menstruation or cysts in the ovary or even fibroid in the uterus. Then we need to also consider how old is too old for cancer screening. For instance, if the 10 year life expectancy uh, is not uh, for instance, seven to nine years benefit from screening, and uh, you cannot see uh, beyond 10 years, and then this screening will not be suitable for this particular individual. And if this individual is not prepared to go for any uh, treatment, uh, there's no point in the doing an elaborate uh, cancer screening. And the other aspect that we need to consider is the age of the uh, so-called incidence, uh, where like for ovarian cancer, where it's higher, in older women, which is above 50, so you would not want to do uh, that test for a woman who is 40. So another way to present this, uh, for average risk, uh, colorectal cancer, uh, 50 and above. Yeah? Uh, fecal uh, immunochemical test is uh, considered a very helpful and uh, effective test, which is done every year. And for colonoscopy, if it's indicated, it's done every 5 to 10 years. And for breast, in the women between 50 to 69, mammogram is done every two years. And for those who are between 40 to 49, mammogram can be considered where the benefits outweigh the harm. And this can be considered on a yearly basis because women in this age group uh, in Singapore have a higher breast density and therefore it should be done on a yearly basis. And cervical cancer for women uh, aged 25 to 29, pap smear is considered a very good and effective test and for those who are sexually active, it should be done every three years. And for women who are aged 30 and above, a HPV DNA test is recommended and this can be done every five years. And for colorectal cancer by colonoscopy, yes, it should be uh, considered for uh, those who are 50 and above and uh, this can be repeated every five to 10 years depending what was found. And for those who are intermediate risk, for instance, those who have a first relative, first degree relative who have cancer, and these uh, individuals can have uh, colonoscopy uh, that is 10 years, uh, 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 within 10 years of the age of the diagnosis of the youngest member of the family who had cancer of the colon. And this can be repeated every five years. And personal history of colorectal polyps. So depending on the type of polyps, uh, if it's hyperplastic, it can be done or repeated after five years. If it's an adenoma, it should be repeated after three years. And these are high risk group for women who have uh, genetic uh, risk, uh, BRCA carriers, and mammogram and MRI breast uh, can be considered for these individuals and starting from age 25 to 30. And for those who have uh, chronic hepatitis B and uh, the gastroscopy, or rather, I beg pardon, alpha fetoprotein uh, is recommended together with ultrasound of the hepatobiliary system, and this is done every six months. And for those who have a uh, problem with, say, uh, individuals uh, who smoke cigarettes of uh, more than 30 pack years uh, and are continuing to smoke uh, or had quit less than 15 years ago, a low dose uh, CT scan uh, can be considered every year. And for the men, uh, those who are aged 50 to 70, 
uh, with life expectancy of more than 10 years, uh, they can consider a prostate-specific antigen test. And at this juncture, I'd like to uh, suggest that besides doing cancer screening tests, we should also check uh, with our patients uh, whether they drink alcohol or not, especially for women, uh, because alcohol is classified as a group one human carcinogen by the International Agency for Research, and is considered to be toxic for our body. And alcohol is known to cause uh, DNA damage in the cells, uh, resulting in the increased estrogen levels and may lead to obesity. 118 studies have concluded that any amount of alcohol increases a woman's risk of breast cancer and regular drink drinkers more at risk. And uh, compared to women who does not drink uh, any uh, alcohol, a woman who takes three drinks per week has 15% increased risk. Uh, this risk goes up by 10% for each additional drink she has on a regular basis. And one in four uh, breast cancer cases is attributable to alcohol usage. And this occurs in women who drinks one bottle of beer or two small glasses of wine on a daily basis. And the other thing that we need to uh, look at for women uh, who want to check for uh, cervical cancer, and this is considered a category one screening, and it's recommended for all women who are sexually active. And they should start uh, screening at the age of 25. And uh, for 25 to 30, uh, it is a pap smear, uh, which is done every three years. And uh, for those who are above 30, then they will consider uh, HPV testing. And for fecal for cord blood, and this, uh, it will be helpful to pick up uh, colorectal cancer, uh, recommended for average risk uh, individuals and uh, it is started on from 50 years and above. And an average risk person who is asymptomatic, uh, individuals who are 50 and above uh, should begin doing this uh, stool for cup blood test. And colonoscopy, this is one of the recommended screening tests for the average test uh, risk asymptomatic population from age 50 and above. And the other thing that we should also take note uh, besides cancer screening, is to check uh, of, on the patients that we see uh, regard to their body mass index. If they are obese, uh, this is considered a risk factor for colorectal cancer and uh, increases the risk uh, by 1.5 to 2.8 folds, especially for those who have abdominal obesity. The other thing that we should also remember to check with our patient is on smoking, because smoking uh, would also increase uh, cancer risk. For instance, smokers who uh, smoke more than 20 pack years have an increased uh, risk from two to threefold. 30% increased risk of colorectal cancer, 50% increased risk of dying from colorectal cancer. And the risk persists 20 years after quitting. This is a, a good way to summarize. And uh, for those who are familiar with Screen for Life, uh, for Singaporeans, uh, for those who are age 25 and above, uh, cervical cancer screen can begin. And for those who are above uh, 40, uh, they can also add on uh, chronic disease screening like cholesterol, blood sugar, in addition to cervical cancer. And for those who are 50 and above, they can add on a colorectal screen like stool for cord blood and also uh, for uh, colonoscopy and or uh, add on the uh, chronic disease and the cervical cancer uh, besides a uh, breast mammogram. And these are just uh, charges that you can see that uh, from Screen for Life, for Pioneer Generation, uh, they don't need to pay a single cent for Medica. And uh, for those who are holding the charge orange and blue card, uh, it's $2. And for the rest, it's only $5. I come to the end of my presentation. I'd like to just share with you uh, how I benefited from the understanding of what it means to square off the curve of my patient. Now, most of us would uh, remember the word aerobics. It was termed by uh, Dr. Kenneth Cooper in the 70s. He also coined uh, a phrase, uh, squaring off the curve, which I benefited a lot. And what does that mean? Most of us think that when we reach uh, 40 years of age, we actually might end up with high blood pressure, with diabetes, with uh, heart disease, 
and then we end up being bedridden and we, we, we kind of uh, go that way. But Kenneth Cooper uh, says that we can actually square off our curve. It does, at the end, we can live to the last days of our life without having any chronic conditions. And uh, how do we do that? We delay the onset of diseases, we pick up uh, cancer early, and we compress our morbidity so that we can continue to live till the last days of our life. And there's a video clip that I'd like us to watch and we shall uh, learn something from him. It's just less than two minutes. A little bit faster, 3.6 miles an hour. No, I could never predict what I'd be doing at the present time all over the world. And to be 87 years of age, I never thought I'd get there so my father died at 77. I would already outlived him by 10 years. Now I'm going to go through some exercise on the equipment. Yeah, the whole world's opening up to us because we're proving that preventive medicine's here to stay. 18, 19, 20. Now keep in mind when I was in medical school back in the 50s, we were taught that preventive medicine was a Cinderella of the medical specialists because there's no profit in health. The profit's in disease. Look at this fantastic races we have here now. And I'm happy to say it's all paid for. Chuck, good to see you. Good to see you again, how are you? 21st century medicine is at least proper weight, proper nutrition, and proper exercise. You have to combine all of them. You just can't just concentrate just on one. If you want to control your weight. But remember, your health is your responsibility. It's not the responsibility of the government, the insurance company, or physician. It's what you do for yourself. How long you live, and how well you live, and hopefully square off the curve, that's my goal, live a long, healthy life with fullest, and then die suddenly. My life will be complete. The first step in getting fit is to avoid inactivity. Uh, just try to walk collective or sustained, at least 30 minutes most days per week. They can increase the life expectancy by at least six years and reduce death from all causes by 58%. As you get older, you need to incorporate more weight training. During your youth, you have good muscle mass up to about 50 years of age. If you don't do something after 50 years of age, you're gonna lose muscle mass. Let's do something along with that. 29 and 30. That concludes my workout. Thank you for watching. I'm sure we have learned something from this uh, uh, video clip and uh, this is an important reminder for us how important is a healthy lifestyle and uh, what we need to do uh, for us primary care doctors. Our role really is to help our patient and especially, especially so uh, for every patient that uh, comes to my consult room, I ask myself one question, can I help square off this person's curve? And uh, I would spend a bit of time to uh, consider cancer screening as something that will help my patient square off the curve. On that note, thank you very much.